So hello uh, everyone. It's so nice to be in Nanchang, to be back in Nanchang for TEDx Yacht Lake. When Selena, one of the organizers, and I were talking about the content for my speech today, I told her that I wanted to say something deep, something that might uh, help you foster an active attitude towards life, because we want to see the future this afternoon. However, she asked me one question. What kind of specific knowledge could you offer to the audience from your own perspective? Which reminded me of one thing that I have been doing for a long time, translation. And here comes the title of my speech today. Okay. So, the future of translation, viewpoints from a practitioner. So before looking at the future of translation, I'd like to focus on the concept of practitioner. So one quick question, how many of you have heard about this concept before seeing the title of my speech today? Please raise, up, uh, raise your hand. Okay, I see less than five, okay. So to be frank, this concept was also brand new to me four years ago when I started my PhD program. This concept is closely related with the uh, uh, this concept is closely related with the long established disputes between theory and practice. And as, so as Peter Newmark once joked. So those who can write, those who cannot translate, those who cannot translate write about translation. So, this sentence talks about the relationship among writing, translating, and translation research. And it can be seen that many people believe that practice is superior to research. So, uh, so, uh, so practice structure is uh, quite related with translation because, on the other hand, Many uh, translation researchers refuse to do the job of a translation practi uh, practitioner. So the relationship is very tight. However, this is quite uh, a different scenario for a translation practice researcher because a translation practice researcher does practice and research at the same time. So a translation practice researcher has not only mastered sufficient skills in translation but also analyzes translation phenomena from different theoretical perspectives. So, uh, namely, a translation practice searcher views theory and practice as mutually beneficial. So luckily, there is a translation practice searcher standing in front of you today who wants to share some of his uh, personal viewpoints about the future of translation. Um, I'd like to talk about two questions. So the first is, are there any differences between translation and translation studies? Second, if someone knows two or more languages, can he or she be automatically considered as a translator? So before discussing the above mentioned two points, I'd like to ask some of you to answer the question, what is the definition of translation and translation studies, in your opinion. So, any volunteers? Hello? Okay, um, maybe, oh, okay, there is one. Thank you. Um, as far as I'm concerned, translation is a kind of action. It's about to translate the uh, text into um, in another language you desire. And translation studies is about uh, study on translation. Mm -hmm. It's about research, some research on translation. Okay, thank you. So uh, just now I have familiarized you with the difference between theory and the practice. So I guess some of you might have sensed the difference between these two terms. So translation actually deals with the um, act, the act of translating, while translation studies is not concerned 
with the act of transiting directly, but the complex of problems clustered around the phenomena of translating and translations. So this is stated by James Holmes in 1972, the name and the nature of translating studies, which is the manifesto for translating studies as an academic discipline. So the answers that you just gave have also touched upon some fundamentals of translation, which means translation is the transfer from one language into another. Yes, exactly. But this is not the whole picture. So, one of the earliest works dealing with the definition of translation goes back to 1959 by Homan Jakobsen on linguistic aspects of translation, in which he divided translation into three categories, which are intralingual translation, interlingual translation, and intersemiotic translation. I know these concepts are might be uh, unfamiliar to you, and I'm going to explain to you so that you know what they are exactly. So, intralingual translation deals with language variations within one language system. For example, if you know Nanchan dialect and Mandarin, then it's called intralingual translation. While interlingual translation, we know. So it's between different languages. So, for example, Chinese and English. And the third one, intersemiotic translation, deals with verbal and non-verbal information. For example, we have sign language interpreting, which means you interpret someone's gestures into uh, some information, some information to others. Okay. So, um, in the same. So um, now let me, uh, no, I have explained this to you. Mm. So I'm going to talk about the second question. If someone knows two or more languages, he or she is a Catholic, what do you think? Do you believe it's true or not? No? Or yes? Okay. I think many people hold this opinion, just like our host Jason said, uh, you know, someone bothers him to translate because he knows different languages. And I think this is quite related with how we describe translators and how translators work, uh, their work is presented to us. I have, I'm going to give you some examples. The first one is a poem from, uh, by Ma Tu Yi, which is, 红光道塔言语书从此人间要向虚 and the, the meaning, so the translation of this is as uh, follows, and I'm going to tell you briefly the background information of this. So in prehistoric time, um, Adam and Eva's descendants, which means human beings, want, want to build a tower in order to go back to the paradise. And then when God knows that, he decides to, uh, to destroy the tower because he believes that if the tower is constructed, his authority will be challenged. So he made the spell, Babel. And then people were scattered in different places with different languages. And that's why we need translators and interpreters in order to help communication. And this one, in the Chinese tradition, we also have this. It's uh, the description of translators, so I'm going to read this as well. It's from the Book of Rights, which is Li Ji. So, Wu Fang Zhi Ming, Yan Yu Bu Tong, Shi Yu Bu Tong, Da Qi Zhi, Tong Qi Yu, Dong Fang Yue Ji, Nan Fang Yue Xiang, Xi Fang Yue Di Di, Bei Fang Yue Yi. So, you can see that this description also talks about how translators work. So, we, uh, we work between different languages. And especially when we watch the press conference by the premier, so we see those uh, beautiful interpreters working between uh, English and Chinese. So uh, against this background, many people believe that if someone knows two or more languages, then he or she is a translator. And against this background, many people hope that since we now have computers, we have 
uh, mobile phone apps. So we can inst we can store uh, different pairs, uh, uh, different matched pairs of information into the computer. So in the future, human tra translates will be substituted by machines. So what do you think? Do you think human translates will diminish in the future? No. No. no? Okay. Thank you. So. Um, that's actually what I want to tell you about. So this is why I'm going to skip it. So I'm going to present some of my arguments about how we should see the future of translation. From my uh, viewpoint, there are four points that I or four cases that I would, I would like to present to you in order to make you understand more why human translators are needed in the translating process. So the first one is the translation of literary texts, because this is not uh, often done in a, per a perfect manner by machines. For example, we have this one. So if you know this, if you watch uh, Princess Guan Zhu, and then you know when Zi Wei says something to her Kang, so this one is taken from this poem. It's from uh, a poem of the Han Dynasty, so which is called Shang Ye. Okay. So, could I have someone read this for me, or for us? Do you want to challenge your uh, Chinese proficiency? Okay, there's the one girl there. Thank you. So let's appreciate the poem in Chinese. Yes, read it in Chinese. Yeah, in Chinese. Okay. 上野,我欲与君相知,长命无绝衰,山无棱,张水为竭,东雷正正,下雨雪,天地河,乃敢与君绝。I will uh, explain this to you at the end of my talk about why it should be read. Uh, it, sh it, is in, it is this character instead of that. So let me bring, let me present what Google Translate has for you. And you can read it on the material. So it's like, oh, evil. <laughs> so I want to know each other. So longevity never decline. Mountain without masculine. The river is exhausted. Winter lay zhen zhen. So summer rain and snow, heaven and earth together, is there and dream absolutely. So this was taken from Google Translate. So do you think this translation is intelligible? It's funny, but if you want our foreign you know, guest to, to understand what the original said, uh, poem says, then this is definitely not something that you want, to, you want him or her to see, right? So I'm going to present another one to you, which is translated by Professor Wang Ronghei. So you can see, O oh, heaven above, I will shower you with my love. It will endure despite the fates above. So when mountains do not rise high, or rivers run dry, or winter thunders come by, or summer snows fly, or the earth meets the sky, so only then shall I abandon my love. So what do you think about this one? That's much better? Okay. Unfortunately, this, this was not translated by me. <laughs> it's by Professor Wang Ronghei from uh, Suzhou University. Okay. He's about 72 or 4, maybe. I don't know. I met him several years ago. So this is the, uh, the first point I would like to illustrate. And the second one is the translation of new words or dialect is often misconducted by machines. For example, I think many of you, maybe one or two months ago, were attracted by a very famous TV series, which is called Renmin de Yi, right? So, so there's a new word named Chuanfen. So I guess all of you know what, what this means, right? Chuanfen. So when I put this into Google Translate, I have this. So I have succeeded in being the name of the people. Okay. So, the, 
First, the translation is, is wrong. It's not the same meaning as the original, and also translation is left out, right? So I would say uh, this is by Google Translate, and also we have the translation of dialect. Could I have another person read this for us? Okay, here's and a volunteer, and let's see how challenging this would be for Google Translate. 今晚的夜亮好严，想你，想花短信给你，想打电话给你，想写封信给你，想为你唱首歌，想为你弹钢琴，想你想的无法呼吸，只想进你一命，抚抚摸着你，然后带你去看夜抗最亮的醺醺。And I think most of you understand what this means, right? We know, okay. So let's see what Google Translate present to us. So tonight, night light again, like you, would like to spend money to you, would like to make a statement to you, want to write a letter to you, want to uh, choke you for the song, want to play your liver. Thank you. Uh, think you want can not skin, just want to close your life. The tiger touched you thrust plate, blew and take you to see the light pit, the most stuffed smoke smoke. So it, it is also funny to you know read this translation, but this is not actually what the dialect wants to present to the audience. So here yeah, I just randomly uh, transit that so tonight's round moon reminds me of you so I miss you so much uh, that I want to send text messages to you to give phone calls to you to write letters to you to sing songs to you uh, and to play the piano for you because you take my breath away I just want to have a chance to see you and ca uh, caress your face and, th and take you to see the brightest star in the sky so that's my transition I think this is easy and you can also do this but, so, so this is the second point that I would like to illustrate, and the third point is not that funny. So, is that when the speaker makes a mistake in the statement, the machines cannot detect the uh, the mistake, while as a human translator, you can correct the information in your translation. Let me give you an example. So, in March, that's three months ago. So I interpreted for these two uh, experts from Geneva Center for Autism. It was a five-day consecutive interpreting practice. So in the in the first day, so the, the host, so the, uh, okay, that was me translating, and then so in uh, in the first day, the host introduced the two experts to the audience. So she said. 两位专家来自日内瓦啊孤独症中心。尽管该中心以日内瓦命名，但是其位于加拿大的多伦多，而不是瑞典的日内瓦。So I put this into Google Translate, and I have to admit that this translation is much better than the translation of literary text or dialect. So we can see, okay, the two experts come、uh, came from the Geneva Autism Center. Although the center was named after Geneva, it was located in Toronto, Canada, and not in Geneva, Sweden. So, from the quality or from the words, you understand this is almost an almost perfect translation, right? However, you have noticed that there is one mistake in the original text, which is sorry, which is. Okay, this is in red, so maybe you cannot see it clearly, because、um, Geneva, Geneva is not a city in Sweden, but it's a city in the Switzerland. Switzerland is the second largest city in Switzerland. So when I interpreted for the host, I silently corrected her mistake in my translation. So she did, didn't know this. Till now, but you know, but you do not know who she is. So this is the third point that I would like to illustrate 
why human translators are not uh, should be should be needed. And the last point is that if the translation needs to be localized, the machine would not be able to detect it. So let me briefly intro uh, introduce or explain what localization means to you. So localization, which is a very hot topic now in translation studies, which means it may be involve the substitution of inappropriate cultural symbols and the translation of text, including the need to fit specific uh, space constraints on the screen or page, etc. So this is taken from Jeremy Monday's Introducing Translation Studies, which was published last year. It's the fourth edition. So I'm going to give you this concrete example. Still take the uh, still take the interpreting practice that I did in March. So at that time we were training teachers. So which means the two ex the two experts they deliver some class they gave classes to the teachers and the teachers. So we have warm up activities every day, every or every morning. So. There is one question, which is, what would you sacrifice in order to attend the polar bear swim? When I heard about this, my reaction was like, excuse me, what is polar bear swim? And why do I need to sacrifice something in order to attend this one? So this is closely related with the cultural you know, difference between China and Canada. However, luckily, when I did this, I, did, I, I made some preparation before doing this because I know I have the materials beforehand. So I checked on Wikipedia. So it says that a polar bear plunge or swim is an event held during the winter where participants enter a body of water despite the low temperature. So in Canada, Polar bear swims are usually held on New Year's Day to celebrate the New Year. But in China, we do not have this kind of activity, right? So if I ask you what, kind, what sacrifice you want to make in order to attend this activity, I guess most of you would be like, no, I don't, I don't want to attend this activity because I don't know what this is. So in, in this case, we need localization so that the audience knows the meaning of the original text. So I, what I did was, I changed it into visiting relatives on the Lunar New Year's Day. So which means, on New Year's Day, we go out, right, to visit our um, relatives, and they need to get red envelopes to get money from our uh, relatives. So, if you do not go there, you will not receive the lucky money. Yeah. So, so what kind of sacrifice would you want to make in order not to go to get the money? I think in this sense, in this case, the, what the original text means is perfectly conveyed to the audience. So, localization is also something that the machine translation would not do. Okay, so to conclude, the future of translation. I have to admit that uh, machine translations can be used as translation tools, and we can use a corpus in order to help us translate different terms or terminologies. However, human translators are still the core of translation because translation is definitely beyond transferring one language into another. So. As a trans translator and interpreter trainer, I want to say that the future of translation will be the combination of machines and human translators. And being a good human translator is not only about mastery language proficiency, but also translation skills and career responsibility. And this, I believe, is the future of translation. Thank you.